Let's everybody find a chair. Revelation chapter 18. And uh, everybody's getting situated. Revelation 18, verse 1. We'll bow our heads together. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for a, a really good day, great day in church already. And we look forward to what you'll say to us tonight. And Lord, uh, again, we're looking at something prophetic through the glass darkly. Nevertheless, we trust that you can speak to our hearts and teach us and guide us into all truth. Help us to understand these things and know what to do about it. And I pray that you please uh, not just be with myself tonight, but the preacher to follow. And uh, Father, we look forward to your time and presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple of announcements. I have an exam that I need to give you the notes for. Please remind me. Like, actually remind me. If you see me forgetting, I I don't want to skip it because we're running out of weeks. We're going to finish Revelation soon, so we need to get that exam in. And then also we have a preacher afterwards, but Sean's going to preach for us. Um, so it, it won't be long, but I would appreciate it. If you would like, to, how can I put that? If you're a degree student, you must stay. If you are anything but a degree student, it is optional. But if you can stick around for another 10, 15 minutes, it's not a long sermon, but this is part of fourth year student assignments is they have to do oral uh, instead of written assignments, it's oral stuff. So he's going to be preaching for us tonight. All right, Revelation 18, the chapter breaks into three parts, <clears throat> verses 1 to 8, heaven's view of Babylon. And of course, remember, we are talking about mystery Babylon, okay? Uh, verses 9 to 19, earth's, earth's response to Babylon's fall. And then verses 20 to 24, heaven's response to Babylon's fall. All right, chapter 18 and verse 1 now. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now that phrase, we met this phrase in chapter 14. I showed you some verses back in the book of Jeremiah when the historical Babylon fell. It, the prophet also pronounced that judgment the same way. Is fallen, is fallen. And I've always taken it to be that, that we're... By repeating it, we're getting one fall for the historical and one fall for the prophetical. It could be, though, there are times when God repeats himself within one verse, and he does it to emphasize a thing. This is, it's clearly marked this way in the book of Job and in the book of Genesis. God repeats it just to tell you how sure that thing is. For instance, Pharaoh's thing is, and then later on that happens again elsewhere. So I, I assume that's why we're getting it twice. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Now, F-O-U-L, that's like a a gross, a nasty kind of thing. That's not like bird, foul. That's F-O-W-L, for those of you English majors there. The hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, it might sound strange to go devils, spirits, and then bird. Why, why the bird? So let me give you a couple, uh, come to Isaiah chapter 34. I just want to make the connection, and this, I, I know I've touched on this elsewhere, but maybe you weren't here for that part of it. So Isaiah 34. Now, while you're getting that, you probably remember when Jesus was baptized the uh, Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. So we see clearly there that in the, within the spiritual realm, a spirit can manifest in the shape or the form of a bird. And in the Holy Spirit's case, a dove. But I'm going to show you now, there's some other unclean spirits that manifest also as different kinds of birds. Isaiah 34, verse 11. Uh, now, I, let, let me give you context with this. Let's start reading at verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. That controversy, by the way, still going on today, this is the conflict in the Middle East. Who owns this land? That's the controversy of Zion. That will continue all the way through the tribulation. The Antichrist will pretend to have that straightened out. He'll have that seven-year peace treaty signed into effect so that Israel gets, uh, to, let's say, to operate in that land and, and use and own that land and then... That will be busted halfway through. But verse 9, The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become 
burning pitch. When we come back with Jesus, we will see this with our eyes. When, when he comes back, there is this great fire that goes before him, right? That comes from him, proceeding, and it just burns up everything in, within uh, its path. And it creates, these, it creates a lake of fire on the earth. And that lake of fire will exist for the next thousand years on the earth during the millennial time. So that in Revelation 19, we'll see it next week. It's called a lake of fire. And then eventually, heaven and earth flee away, right? This earth that we're now on is not eternal. One day, heaven and earth flee away, no more place found for them. And these things, this temporary lake of fire actually gets transferred into the permanent lake of fire. So I'm just trying to, so that as you read this, you know where this fits in the, in the chronology of everything. Verse 10, and it shall not be quenched day nor night. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So as long as it's there, no one's ever going to be able to exist in this fire. It's, it's a lake of fire. Verse 11, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Those are birds. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Now, I'm getting a bit deep and kind of outside of Revelation 18, but just so you know what this is dealing with, that line of confusion, stones of emptiness, uh, this is, you will be able to walk out to this lake of fire. You and I will be able to see this, walk out and see people in it. Now, this is clearly stated at the end of Isaiah. Matter of fact, I'll show you the verse just now. But as you go out there and see it, right, these people in that lake of fire are confused. Why am I here? What did I do? Why, God? They're asking those questions until their judgment, right? Because the judgment for them doesn't happen until another thousand years. So even, I'm, I'm going to get too deep here, but during the millennium, you can, not, not, let me not say you, but people can, if they call their brother fool and they don't have a cause, right? Jesus said, you're in danger of hell fire. Just for going to somebody and saying, you're a moron, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this, this is evidence there are no cars in the millennium, <laughs> right? If there, is, if there are people driving, <laughs> everybody's in danger of hell fire in that case, right? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so you can see verse 11, there's a cormorant, a bittern, owl, raven, there are various birds. Now, you can go back to the book of Leviticus, and you'll see these birds are unclean birds. They're in the list of birds that the Israelites could not eat. But these unclean birds are a connection, right? That's the physical world in, Le in Leviticus, but in the spiritual world, they are unclean spirits, right? So come, come to the end of Isaiah. I told you I'd show you that verse. Isaiah chapter 66, right at the very end. Verse 24. Isaiah 66, 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now, just again, you can read the context later. You, you, this is during that kingdom time. You can go out and see the people burning there and this is jesus quoted this you might remember where he was the one that quoted it three times in one passage where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched so this is something we will see at one point all right come back to revelation 18 again now this mystery babylon is become the habitation of devils the hold of every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird this is <laughs> i forgive me i this is the Kerplek for unclean spirits. This is where they hang out. This is where they go to, you know, exchange notes. You know that, right? That the unclean spirits in the spiritual world, they talk to each other. They know you. They know what goes on in your house. They know, they know, what's, they know what affects you. You remember this from the Gospels, right? When Jesus taught us this, he said an unclean spirit can come out of a man. And then he'll walk about through dry places, seeking rest, finding none. And then he'll go get seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And he'll go, hey guys, I got us a good hanging out spot. I got us a good kaoplek. That guy, he got religion, he got cleaned up, but he's empty inside. There's nothing going on in there. 
So we can go in and affect his thinking. I mean, this is we've been talking about on Thursday nights, right? We can put some strongholds in there and just run that guy's life. So they, they collaborate. They talk. And this is like their convention center. This is where they all get together. That's their hangout, their habitation. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a church. Think about that. It's in a church. I, I teach you this in discipleship that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they all have their specialities, the places, the realms that they like to work. The flesh, the world, you know, the world is peer pressure. That's his thing. The flesh, it always wants to push boundaries and that kind of stuff, be rebellious. But then the devil, he likes to hang out in, in spiritual places, right? He likes to confuse people in churches. That's, he can do lots of other things, mind you, but that's where he really thrives. He blinds the minds of them which believe not, lest they should see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. So it's no surprise, really, that we find this, this mass of unclean spirits hanging out in a religious movement. All right, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. All right, so she has corrupted everyone. All nations have drunk of the wine of, her, of the wrath of her fornication. I mentioned last week that wine, that's a metaphor for her teachings, right? So they've taken that cup and they've said, yep, we believe what this religious group is telling us. And remember, this religious group is in conjunction with the Antichrist. So they're pointing to him saying he's the good guy. He's the Messiah. Let's follow him. Let's all get along. And these Bible thumping, Bible believing Christians that go around saying you must be born again. Those are the bad guys. Right? And all the people, the general population of the world, listens to that. Says, yep, that's what we like. We like this church that helps us all get along, and now we're getting along with the government, and we're, you know, this is how we think it ought to be. And they all drink of that. And then the kings of the earth commit fornication. So now they, they have governmental support. The governments of the world are accepting this as their religion. So they make it the official religion of their country. Right? So in the, in the end times, in those seven years, you, everybody is commanded to be part of that religion. And it ends up, you know, you have to take the mark to be part of it. And then it also talks about merchants. Now, this is, again, no surprise. If you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. So it's all linked together. But if you want to do business, right, these businesses and this religious group, one sponsors the other. You know, they're scratching each other's back here. So it's kind of like come to this church and then we'll do business with you. Now, for those of you that had church history this year, you remember Constantine really kick-started this by saying if you come to church, to the Christian church, in his day he didn't call it necessarily the Catholic church, but if you come to our church, we will give you a, a brand new white garment or we'll give you 20 pieces of silver or we'll give you tax breaks if you come to our church, if you leave paganism. Well, you can see, if, if you want to get ahead, just come to this church. You're going, it's going to help you in business if you do it. So that's kind of where the history of all of that starts, and then it culminates here. Now, verse number four, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now, the plagues are, of course, the destructions that we're going to be reading about in just a moment. But God takes a break here in verse 4. He's describing Babylon and what's so bad about them. But then he says, he addresses his people. He tells that angel, you tell him, come out of her, my people. So there are a lot of God's people that are following this movement, this spirit of Antichrist to say, let's just ignore truth and get along. If it helps me with business, if it helps me in society, and if it's comfortable, we unify Truth goes out the window, and the, the command has come out of her. Um, many times, you probably, even, it, this still happens lots of times, where somebody realizes their particular denomination is wrong, and then maybe they grew up in it. And it's not to say everybody that sits in that church is, is bad and not saved, but that denomination, whatever it is, lots of them have this issue. They have some major fundamental things that are just wrong. And that person, with all the right intentions, says, okay, I'm going to stay in this church. And try to be a light that shines in this church and fix it from within. Now, number one, history teaches us that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Many people tried that for hundreds of years. It did not work. Eventually, the reformers got it right and started pulling away, pulling away. Pull 
And to be honest, they didn't really mean to. (laughs) Martin Luther did not want to leave the Catholic Church. They kicked him out. He set out to reform it from within. But once they kicked him out, it created this other movement, and people start realizing what's so different about it, sola scriptura, sola, you know, only faith, only grace. And then they start saying, okay, this is viable, that's not. They, they found out that verse 4 is the right way to do it. Come out. Come out. Verse uh, 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. She's been committing these for a while. I've shown you verses. I'm not going to turn you to these again. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Right? So in the days of Paul, the spirit of Antichrist. John, in 1 John chapter 2, he writes about the spirit of Antichrist. It's already working, and it's just getting worse and worse as we press towards the, or into the end times. And God, it's not like he's looking down and he doesn't see what's happening. He knows that people are being deceived. He knows that the devil is walking about as a roaring lion. He knows that this whore, right, that was the terminology from last week, this, this great whore is, is messing up massive amounts of people, and one day he's going to make it right. And all through Revelation, we've been seeing this, justice. The people cry out for justice. And God is reminding us, I haven't forgotten. Remember this in the book of Genesis we studied in chapter 15? The iniquities of the Amorites are not yet full. Remember that? Yeah. So now, it's, God is waiting for the sins to get full. In verse 5, they've reached unto heaven. Now think of this. They reached unto heaven. Imagine God's long-suffering. He waited for him to get that high. But now, that, that's from the God side of it. When you think of, it as, we think of this through the lens of, of God's mercy, that's incredible, the long-suffering. But now think of this through the lens of mankind. How many sins have they committed? Right? How much wickedness has been going on? Let me give you a few. I've written some on the board here. I'm not going to show you all of them. You can write them down if you'd like. Genesis 18, we looked at this with Sodom. God said their sins have come up before me. Ezra 9, verse 6, Jeremiah 51, verse 9, and Jonah 1, verse 2. I would like to take you to the one in Jeremiah. So let's get Jeremiah 51. If you've been wronged, if you've been hurt by the world's system, you would be waiting for justice. If you took that to court and said, listen, I've been cheated, and the lawyer or the magistrate or whoever's in charge says, okay, we'll, we'll take care of this. We will review your case and get back to you. Imagine if you waited 10 years and never heard anything, right? That, that's the reason God puts these things, yeah, these kind of verses in here is to say, listen, I haven't forgotten. I am going to do something about it. You might be waiting several years, but I am, I'm not going to forget what they've done. Jeremiah 51 and verse 9. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her. Let us go everyone into his own country. For her judgment reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. Which is just, it's a, it's a fancy way, like almost a poetic way of saying her sins have just gotten so much and piled up so much that they've reached all the way to the footstool of God. Right? Now, it's not as if a sin is a physical thing that you can actually stack up. Right? But David and, and many authors in the Bible uh, used metaphors to help you think of it. David would say, my sins are more than the hairs of my head. Now, I, I, Jesus said that we, we, we can't count the hairs of our head. Well, some people can, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting better as time goes on. My, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm losing sins daily almost. But, <laughs> but, but Jesus said that, the, that God, the Father, He has every hair of your head counted. Every hair is numbered. Right? And, but, but David said that my sins are more than the hairs of my head. So I've always put those two verses together. I thought, my goodness, I cannot imagine how many sins I've committed. I, I don't know. I'm trying not to commit any more. And there's a chance, right? Psalm 19, David said, keep me from secret faults. Even, even the things I'm not aware of yet. 
that I've just been doing it this way. This is how I was brought up. I didn't even know this was wrong. I didn't know I was offending you, God. But it's just wrong. We don't even know, but, but God knows. God knows. So I see this kind of verse where it reaches up to heaven. That's a lot of mercy and long suffering on God's part, but that's a lot of sin on mankind's part. A whole lot of sin. Let's come back to Revelation 18. So God says, listen, I, I, I have not forgotten what they've done. And here's what I'm going to do about it. Verse 6. This is actually, best I can tell, this is the angel talking to God now. He says in verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. That's a lot of doubles. <laughs> double unto her double, which is another way to say double it. <laughs> Do it twice. According to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Now, I've read a few commentaries that really struggle with this verse. And I, I never have. I, I was shocked, actually, when I picked up the commentaries and found a lot of verbiage on this, saying that this can't mean what it says. Because God will always give a punishment that fits the crime. And this says, give a double punishment. So wouldn't that be con contrary to the character of God if you commit this sin and he gives you this punishment, right? D double it. That, how can that be right? But remember, we're not to be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So look at verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. She was she has been committing the most atrocious, abominable things that you can imagine and getting away with it, sitting on top saying, look at how wonderful I am, pretending to be the, the uh, house of God, the representation of God on the earth. But what has she been doing to God's people? She, it's not as if, I mean, she, did, she has, right? In the past, the Catholic Church has made laws. If you believe and teach or do these things, we will put you to death, right? But what did they do? They did not simply put their version of heretics to death. In a mixed crowd, I wouldn't even do this <laughs> without a mixed crowd. I won't tell you the stories of what those Catholic soldiers would do to people. It is unfathomable. It is be I, I, you just don't think that humans can do those kind of things. So when God says, okay, he, here's what they've been doing. They said, heresy put you to death. But they weren't merciful. They doubled unto that. They added on to that wrath and punishment, and they went way too far. So God says, okay, I'm going to give a fitting punishment. Exactly what they've been doing to my servants. Remember, in the tribulation time, millions of believers are going to die. And they're going to die bad deaths, horrible deaths. So God says, I haven't forgotten that. And what you've been doing to my people, it's going to come right back to you. So I, it's completely just. This is exactly what she deserves because she's been doing it to God's people. Now verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. All right, so God again just reminding us that uh, when he pours out judgment, it's going to match the crime. And guys, I, I want, it's almost comforting if, you've the, if you're the one that's been offended. Right? If you've ever had anybody do you wrong, you've had to go to court and get it settled out, it's comforting to know that justice prevails. And that's, that's the emphasis here. Just peek back at chapter 17, verse 16. Chapter 17 and verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So these, what the ten horns do, right there, that's that uh, representatives of that last or end times government, they hate the whore. And they turn around and attack her. So that's the fulfillment, or, or let's say a cross-reference to Revelation 18 and verse 8. In one day, 
They say, all right, no longer do we, are we going to be affiliated with this church. The government and the church split, and they burn her to the ground. Now, verse 9, 18, 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Verse 10, Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So all the figureheads and kings of the earth, they stand back and go, oh my goodness. This was the richest organization in the world, sitting as a queen, in charge of everything, and in one day, how greatly your life can change in one day. And God says, enough. I'm putting a stop to your nonsense. Done. And in one day, it doesn't matter how fortified you are. It doesn't matter how much insurance you have. It doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank. This is the richest organization in the world. Right? And, and we, guys, we have not seen yet in our day the complete fulfillment of this organization. This is still to come in, an end, in the end times, this one world religion. We've just seen bits and pieces you know, leading up to it. It doesn't matter how well you think you've protected yourself. You can hide your sins as much as you want. You can explain them away. But one day it comes out. And when they do, the kings of the earth who have joined up with her and, and given the, the shop, the approval, say, That's, those are the people of God. They stand back, they distance themselves. Verse 10, standing afar off. They stand back and go, okay, the lightning bolt just fell there. God's fire just fell there. Let's stand back. Um, we, d- we don't want to be a part of that anymore. Then they'll know. Verse 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. <laughs> not because people died, not because they were wrong, not because, hey, they misled us. They, they told us the Antichrist was God. That's not the problem. They had good business. <laughs> they were doing good business, making a lot of money. Oh, shame, our sponsor just fell. Oh, no, now we can't make more money. Now, think of this within the context, within the time frame that it's happening. If that happened today, oh, eh, COVID, COVID. <laughs> we go, shame, it's bad. But this is after the seals, the trumpets, the vials. Do you remember what happens with the water turning to blood and the... The, the heat scorching men and plagues, you know, the boils breaking out and sores all over men. You know what they're worried about? How can we make more money? Demonic horses, demonic locusts flying around, stinging people. They're hurting for five months, wish they could die and they can't. How do we make more money? The love of money is the root of all evil. It's so strong. Verse 12, the merchandise of, now we get a list of all the things that they were busy doing. You know, the, the church, this last time, end times church, is helping these merchants, right? They're making money by sponsoring these guys. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass, and iron, and marble. Now you can just see there's many different facets of society and infrastructure that is represented here. Verse 13, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments. So what what is it? Bath body works? Something like that. (laughs) Probably got a piece of that pie. Uh, Ointments, frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and oh my goodness, slaves? Slaves and souls of men. What's, what's, one of, what's one aspect of their business? Souls. They buy and sell them. Think of that. They buy and sell them. I only know one church ever that's done that. And, and I, growing up as a Catholic, we participated in that. We were taught that, that if somebody dies, you need to pay a certain amount or give something to the church to deliver their soul from purgatory faster and get them out of that limbo state and get them into heaven. I, I, it's bad enough that there's slavery mentioned, right? That they're actually selling people in this time. But the souls of men, that's merchandise to them. God help us if we view it as merchandise. And I, I fear even just, you know, in a good local church, it might be viewed as that sometimes, that the church turns into a business. And, you know, we, get, we want people to come in and tithe, and we want, you know, nice building, nice things, make it look good. And 
all of a sudden, the souls of men is not really the most important thing. It's the pocketbooks of men, right? It, it should, souls should never be a business. That's a ministry, right? Verse number 14. In verse 14, and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Now, I could, well, let me say this, say it a different way. Prophetically speaking, there's not a lot I can add to this. I mean, it's just telling, it's giving us a description of what is going to be lost here. So I'm going to try to, rather than make that more complicated than it is, it's pretty straightforward. I just want to say a few practical things about this. Anybody that makes riches or treasure or wealth, if that's your goal, this is your end. It doesn't matter. Saved or lost even, right? Jesus said that if a man lays up treasure for himself and he's not rich toward God, he calls him a fool, right? If it's all about eat, drink, and be merry, build bigger barns. Now, if God blesses you with bigger barns, okay, that's fine. But if if your life is, de- is defined by how much is in the barn instead of how much is in your heart and how much treasure you lay, laid up in heaven, something's wrong. And the end of it is ev- the, souls, uh, sorry, the fruits that you've wanted, the goals that you've had for life, by the time you get to the end, you're leaving it all behind anyway. You watch it all go up in smoke. And it's done. Verse 15 The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. Do you know how many rich people are going to stand before the judgment one day? And all their life, people bowed down to them and treated them with great respect and I want to say kissed up. (laughs) That makes sense. And and they walked into the fancy of hotels and restaurants. People pull out a table for them and they just had the best treatment. And then they stand before God and God treats them like any other sinner. Can you imagine that rich guy going, hey, uh, call the butler over. Call call the valet. I I need some special. I I want a suite. (laughs) God says, you want a special place in hell? I mean, mean, that's... But that's the end. That's the end of it. In one hour, it's done. In one hour, I I remember a story years ago. What was that preacher's name? R.G. Lee. R.G. Lee. God help me to remember the name of that sermon. He preaches a very famous sermon about Ahab and Jezebel. The name of that sermon will come to me about five minutes after we're done with class, but he preached that sermon over 3,000 times. It was that, and it was that good of a sermon in 3,000 different places. People just wanted to hear that sermon. But in that sermon, he tells a story about a man who every time Brother Lee would preach somewhere on the radio, whatever, this guy would call in and just castigate him and say all kinds of horrible things and make fun of him and mock him. And then one day, Brother Lee gets a call from a hospital saying, there's this guy who calls himself the king of the kangaroo court. He won't give us his name, but he's laying here in this hospital dying. And the only person he wants to talk to is you. And that, and Brother Lee went down there and walked in. And this guy, he said it was just, just a disgusting scene. He was coughing up this black tar out of his, and he was a well-to-do guy. And he walked in, he said, Brother Lee, do you know me? He said, no. He said, I'm the, I'm the king of the kangaroo court, which is, a, you know, a mock court. He admitted, I'm the one that's been judging you this whole time. I'm the one that's been bothering you. He didn't know until that time. He introduced himself. He said, I'm, I'm dying. He said, all I want you to do is go tell people that Satan pays with counterfeit money. Satan pays with counterfeit money. That was it. That was all he learned from his life. Is I spent my whole life just for riches, just to find out at the last hour, in one hour, all my riches, great riches, has come to nothing. I'm laying here dying, no peace in my soul, and that's it. What, what, what a sad existence. Verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea 
stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Well, there have been plenty of cities that have fallen, right, down through time. Jerusalem, Rome, Constantinople, Kiev. I mean, these many other cities have fallen, but none that were so great as her. That sat, what did it say, verse 7? I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. I'll see no sorrow. Nothing could take me down. That's a dangerous place to be in. I don't know if you put this together when you read verse 17. Company and ships and sailors trading by the sea. Think about that in light of the trumpet judgments and the vile judgments that turn the water to blood. And, and yet, right, all of those ships sunk. <laughs> That's what we read. Nothing living. It, it all died. You know what they did? They went right back. To, as soon as the water turned back to you know, floatable water, <laughs> out they go right back to business. It's amazing what God does to get our attention, and we just go right back to it. Simply amazing. Verse 19, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. So they're also just shocked, amazed, impressed at how quickly things can change. Verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So I told you earlier, you can get comfort in seeing justice take place. This is a command for God's people to rejoice at the destruction of the wicked, which seems almost counterintuitive, right? Because Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for them, right? And here he says, they are going down. They're never going to rise back up. You guys rejoice. Now, see, in our earthly lives, we overcome evil with good. We do not try to get them back. Romans 12, right? The, the Lord repays. He recompenses, not us. He, he is the avenger, not Tony Stark. <laughs> that was for Amy. <laughs> not, not Captain America. <laughs> He's not the first avenger. God, <laughs> he's the great avenger. And he says, I'll take care of that. So we rejoice when God brings forth judgment. When you try to exact revenge in your own power and make it right in your own power, in the moment you'll think, okay, they're, they're getting what they deserve. But then afterwards you realize that, that, that doesn't fix it. I have just created another problem. I have now, they made a mistake, now I've made a mistake. Now I've got two mistakes to deal with. <laughs> you just put it in the hands of God and know that one day he's going he's gonna to handle that. Now, Look at the difference here. The merchants, the kings, the sailors, what are they doing? They stand afar off and go, oh, wow, the great city has fallen. Oh, no. And they're mourning over their loss of riches. That's their response. Shock, horror, and now life as we know it will not go on. It won't be the same. Look at heaven's response to the same thing. The earth looks at it and says, oh, man, how can we make more money now? Heaven looks at it very differently. We ought to look at things differently, right? We, we ought to have a different perspective. Our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God help us if we react to the problems of the world the same way the world does. What Jesus say, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. One thing that has always drugged me down, forgive me, I'm just kind of venting a little bit on this. It's, it's always, even when I was a younger Christian, I, I just couldn't stand being around this. When you get in a room and, and it's just a bunch of complaining about how bad the world is. Now, it's one thing to say, did you know, just to bring to people's attention, right? That, hey, something bad is going on. That's fair enough. But then to go on and on, when your fellowship is centered around how bad someone else is, where do you ever see God telling us to center our fellowship around somebody else's sin? It's one thing to acknowledge it, but men, let's, let's maybe have a prayer meeting about it. Or let's, how can we minister to those people? Our attitude should not be sitting around going, yep, they're horrible, they're horrible. Thank God I'm not as other men. You see, that, that just drains you after a while. People just sitting around complaining about, like, okay, listen, South Africa's got issues. What country doesn't? The corruption is rampant. It is really bad. The crime is ridiculous. We live in prisons, right? 
We do. We, li- we live in prisons. This isn't right. This isn't how the world ought to operate. But okay, we can sit around. It's one thing to acknowledge it. Right? But if we sit around just griping about it all the time, how does that fulfill Jesus' command to be of good cheer? I've overcome the world. Yeah? We, we've got to look at it differently. So the command in verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So she has been guilty of killing the apostles, prophets, God's people. So now, justice, you can rejoice. Verse 21, And a mighty angel took up a, a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. So he uses this great stone. It's a sermon illustration. So those of you men that are preachers, this is actually not a bad idea from time to time to have a prop of some sort. You see this all through the Bible. I would not suggest using all the biblical props that the other prophets used, because some of them get weird. Isaiah walked around with his rear end hanging out. (laughs) You go home and read Isaiah chapter 20. And it was a prophetical picture. I mean, can you imagine God saying, hey, Isaiah, <laughs> got a job for you. <laughs> Here am I, send me. Okay. <laughs> and he walks around with his rear end hanging out. And people say, what are you doing? He said, this is what's going to happen to the Egyptians one day. I'm just showing everybody. <laughs> it's a strange way to do it, but it's a sermon illustration. I mean, if you want, that's bad, but if you really want a, a, a difficult one, Hosea. Hosea, go, go find you a harlot, go marry a prostitute. <laughs> that, what a strange command. But he says, listen, this is what's happened to me. So I'm, I, I need to illustrate this for Israel. And in the book of Ezekiel, I think of all the prophets, he had more strange things to do. He had to shave off all the hair of his head, all his eyebrows, everything. And then he had to cut up the hair on a tile and then put some of it in his, in his, uh, in his shirt and then throw it into the wind and then burn part of it and say this is what's going to have a third of you are going to be thrown out and cast out third burn third and cut with the sword at one point he tells the prophet your, your wife's going to die she's going to be taken with a stroke and you're not allowed to weep that's ezekiel was it 25 i think that's tough there have been times i kid you not i've got to that passage and just skipped a few verses i didn't want to read it i, I thought god don't Please, please don't ask me to do that. But I digress a little bit. Sermon illustration. I, I had a guy in Bible school, or I had a guy. There was a guy in Bible school, um, in preacher's class. He, he came to class one night. This, this guy always had a prop. We loved it when it was his turn because we, we get to see some theatrics, you know. So one night, he put a trash can, a, a bin, sorry. Tra- you know trash can, a, a, next to the pulpit, a metal one. This ding dong puts a metal trash can, fire, lighter fluid. Poof. Dude, it's a metal trash can. It, there's wood right here. There's, I mean, the floor is carpet. <laughs> I don't know if that's safe. Lights it on fire and then preaches on the fires of hell while the fire is coming up next to him. <laughs> okay. Help yourself. I mean, he had my attention a little bit for about two seconds because I thought, okay, you're preaching on hell. I want to make sure you don't burn down. (laughs) That is really close to you. The next time he came to preach, he had a snake. I don't know if it was a python or what it was, but a massive, that thing must have been at least two meters long. He came in, it was down one arm around his neck and then down the other arm. And he came in and he preached with that thing squirming around on him. He preached out of Genesis three about the the serpent coming to Eve. And he did. I thought, okay, I'll never forget. I don't know what he said. I just kept thinking, if that thing squeezes, you need to get, I need to get what? <laughs> so it, it, sometimes, if done right, what one guy, I didn't see this, but I, I heard about it. It was in the class before me. This guy, in Nehemiah chapter 8, I don't know if, or, no, sorry, you've never read Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, <laughs> if you've read that chapter, it talks about Ezra getting on top of a pulpit of wood. Now, their pulpits were what we would call a platform or a stage, right? But this guy didn't know that. So when he read, he stood on the pulpit, he thought that the pulpits we have now, it's the same thing that they had in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. So that guy, he got up on the pulpit, standing, it's a slanted structure. 
standing on that pulpit and preached with this horrible like surfing act the whole time. <laughs> the Bible says, we're like, there's going to be a great fall any moment, you know. <laughs> Brother so-and-so is fallen, is fallen. <laughs> so they, they can go too far. It should never be, it should never take the place of the message. It should augment the message. So if you ever want to use one, help yourself, but just be mindful that it, you're not trying to put on a show. You're trying to make a point, okay? And the point of this millstone, come to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Why, why mention the millstone? Uh, a millstone, obviously, you go to the mill, you grind up the corn. This has been a staple of many societies. It is even here in South Africa. So the millstone is a very important part of life. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 6. This will be your attendance code, by the way. Make that look better. There we go. 24, Deuteronomy 24, verse 6. says, No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. So you see the importance. You take that millstone away, the guy can't eat. That's how important it was. And I, I believe that's why God links it to this, to this uh, particular illustration of what he's going to do to Babylon. You might remember Jesus when he wanted to emphasize how bad it was to offend a child. Right? It's bad if you offend anybody. And if you're a stumbling block that prevents somebody to get to Christ, that's horrible. Shame on you. And, and I'm, that's a biblical phrase. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So shame on you if you don't realize you are hindering people from coming to Christ. But Jesus said, if you offend one of the little ones, right, if you make it hard for a little child to know Christ through setting a bad example, telling the wrong story, laughing at the bad joke, whatever it is, right, however you do that, he said, it were better that a millstone were hanged about your neck, cast through the sea. It's better that you get drowned than to do that. Right? So whenever Jesus wanted to show you the weight of that offense, he uses a millstone in the illustration. So it's, I, I believe it all kind of works together. Now, verse 21, and a mighty angel took a, a stone like a great millstone, cast it into the sea, saying, thus with, the vi thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. Millstone's very heavy, so it sinks and that's it. It's not coming back up. Verse 22, And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. You realize what it's going on. It's shutting down life. And this is where people got married. The bridegroom and the bride. He said, we're shutting all that down. No more. And then he says, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So sorcery is manipulating the spiritual realm to achieve a goal in this world. There are several ways to do it. We've already read about these hateful birds, these unclean spirits. And unclean spirits go about basically building strongholds in your mind, teaching you lies, teaching you to view things incorrectly. So they are going in the end times to teach people to hate God's servants and, and convince them that the, the problem with the world is God's servants. Let's all come together against them. So that's part of the sorcery. But also, guys, if you think about what is practiced in some churches, if I were to tell you that tonight we are going to gather around and drink a human being's blood and eat their body cannibalistically, there, there's just no way you can sell that, right? But the, every Sunday growing up, that's what I was taught that I was doing. I'm eating the literal flesh and drinking the literal blood of Jesus. That, I don't know any other way to say it, but that's witchcraft, you can package it another way and go, no, 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 that's just the Lord's Supper. <laughs> that's not the biblical version of it. Well, that's a very twisted version. But also, 
as we get closer and closer to the end, the New Age movement is picking up speed. I don't know, maybe here locally, not as much, but as in other places. It is here, though. But the idea of people tapping into the spiritual world and, and actually feeling that it's fine, that you have your choice of which way you want to get to the spiritual world. I'm going to get in tune with the universe. You know, those kind of movements. It all plays into this sorcery. You're tapping into the spiritual realm to achieve something in this world. Verse 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So she is either directly or indirectly responsible for all the deaths on the earth in this time frame. Now, directly, just like they, the Catholic Church used to do years ago, um, like I said earlier, if you're a heretic, here's how you're going to die. But then when you come into the end times, the, the, forgive me here. I had a great point I was just about to make and it just left my mind. Give me a second. Where was I going with that? Can anybody remember where I was going with that? <laughs> what was I saying when I was leading up to the Catholic Church puts the heretics to death? What did I say right before that? You weren't listening either, were you? <laughs> <laughs> what was I? I had something I was going with that. Oh, that's it. Dir that's it. Directly. Yes, they were directly responsible. So in the end times, this one world religion is directly responsible to say anybody that doesn't agree with our doctrine, you must die. But indirectly, right, all the other people that are slain upon the earth, that this religious organization is giving the nod, telling the Antichrist is perfectly fine to go out and you can kill two thirds of the Jews. You can go out and if they don't take the mark, you can persecute them, you can behead them, all of those things. So she either goes out herself and kills people that don't agree with her or indirectly tells other groups, yes, it's fine to kill those other people because that they don't work within our system. So either directly or indirectly. Okay, so chapter 18, we're just dealing with Babylon. There's not, like I said, prophetically, I can just read it and say that's what's going to happen. So I've tried to add some practical thoughts with it. But any questions on anything in the chapter? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, this older man. Mm-hmm. So telling this older man isn't actually possible to go into the world. Because I can't tell my own soul. No, no. Yeah, you, you can't actually. Um, it's not as if gold or silver can, can change the condition of a soul. No. Uh, this is just people use the idea of the soul and say, that we will do this and that for your soul if you give us enough money. So, but, but they can't actually do what they're saying. It's similar to winning souls. You go after winning souls. So it's not that we actually gain the soul. It's just that we are pointing them to Christ. And if they come to Jesus... Um, yes, I, I, I think I see where you're going there. But the difference, I would say, when we win a soul, the, the term win means to convince or persuade. And, and as you've just said here, we're trying to convince them to come to Christ and accept him as, as their savior. But we are, by preaching the gospel, we heard this morning, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So we are actually doing something that, re that really happens to the soul. We are not just talking about it, collecting the money, and then walking off. So there, there is a difference in what's happening there. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to give you some questions then. This exam will be due by next week. Guys, let me remind you how it works. You have 10 minutes. I'm going to honor system, right? Honor system. 10 minutes. Just 10 minutes. So as soon as you start it, watch the watch. 10 minutes later, you're done. All right? And then email it back to us. So here's what you need to prep for. Uh, what happens when the following seals are opened? And you have to tell me one, two, three, four, five, six. Just the first six, okay? What happens? Now, give, give me the short version. You don't have to spell out, you know, all the verses on it. Which verse in chapter 7 proves that there will be more than 144,000 people in heaven? There's one verse specifically in chapter 7. Number three, what happens when the following trumpets are sounded? And then you have to give me all seven trumpets. Right, again, just, just the highlight word of each will be fine. Number four, what do the seven thunders say? That's Revelation 10. Number five, what are the two witnesses? I'm sorry, who are the two witnesses mentioned in chapter 11? 
Number six, the following signs in heaven point to which entities? So there's a, a woman that's clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, having a crown of 12 stars. What, what does that speak to? And the great red dragon, what does that speak to? Number seven, list at least three of the designation used for the time duration of the latter half of the tribulation. All right, so there's months, there's days, there's different, different ways that it's spelled out. I want you to tell me um, how many months, how many days, that kind of thing. Number eight, which event will cause the whole world to wonder after the beast? Number nine, what sanction is given to those who will not take the mark, name, or number of the beast? So if they don't take it, there's something they're not allowed to do. Number 10, give two peculiar traits of the 144,000 mentioned in chapter 14. There are more than two. I'm just asking for two of them. Number 11, where is the wine press which Jesus will tread located? Right? Chapter 14, at the end, he treads a wine press. Where is that wine press? Number 12, which two songs will the tribulation saints sing while they are in heaven? And that's in chapter 15. And then you have one memory verse, chapter 14, verse 11. All right. So any questions about these questions or any questions about how to write the exam? Anything at all? No? All good? Okay, I'm going to stop the live stream then.